All right, 4.20, so this is the time to start. So thank you very much for being here. My name is Frédéric Devien, or Frederick Debian, something like that, or Fred, or Blueberry, whatever suits you. And I'm uh, the program manager for IoT and edge computing at the Eclipse Foundation. So uh, another foundation uh, that you probably know about and we'll explain a bit, uh, a bit more in this presentation uh, what I'm doing here at this uh, Linux Foundation conference. All right, so the whole point of this talk is to give you a bit of a taste of what Zephyr is and what Eclipse components you can use with it in order to build IoT and embedded solutions. Now, uh, before I say anything else, how many of you are uh, already familiar with the Zephyr operating system? Please raise your hand. Oh, okay, not many. Okay, so that's good because I've got some content to cover that, at least give you the basics, and then give you the basics of what Eclipse IoT is and what components we've got in the toolkit, that kind of stuff. All right, so let's get started. Um, first, if we think about IoT solutions in a general perspective or even an embedded solution, embedded is you know, the, the older established term, but really IoT just adds the fact that you always have a network connection. But whatever project you, concern, uh, you consider, an IoT solution or embedded solution will have a number of characteristics that are different from a standard software project. First is the lifespan. When you build an IoT thing, you build it for 10, 20, 30 years. No way you will rip off the walls of this hotel to replace sensors two years from now, right? So you need to think over the long term. Then obviously, an IoT solution is heterogeneous in the sense that nobody in the market will give you all the software and hardware pieces that you need in a single place. Okay, nobody can do that. So you have to work with multiple vendors. And obviously there's the connectivity aspect in the sense that, well, you always have a network, but it won't be reliable, it won't be stable, and you have to design around that. But the main concern when you think about IoT or embedded is really the fact that you have to work with so many constraints, constraints of power consumption, constraints about the environment, temperature, humidity, you name it, you have to deal with that. And uh, this has a tremendous effect on the type of software and libraries that you will work with. You need everything to be optimized to fit the constraints that you have. And that's why typically Linux will not necessarily fit if you have really a project, an IoT or embedded project that will use um, constraint devices. So I, I picked out here on the slide just three devices, three boards I have lying around at home, okay? And I, I wouldn't pretend they will all serve in a production level environment or anything like that, but just you look at the specs on those things. CPUs, 64 megahertz, 16 megahertz, 64 kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> I mean, last time I ran Linux on a 60-ish something megahertz system, I had air on my head. Can you imagine that? It's been a while. Um, all of that to say that even if embedded Linux made great progress to slim the platform, trim it, you still need you know, a, few, a few dozen megabytes of RAM in order for everything to fit, and maybe more if you want to do real-time that kind of stuff. So that's where an operating system like Zephyr is a perfect fit, because it will run actually on those boards, and it can do something useful with them. Now, uh, every year the Eclipse Foundation runs an IoT developer survey, and uh, we had a question specifically on constraint devices. What are people using in their projects in the real world? And we had about uh, 1,700 uh, replies this year, so it was quite successful. Um, and what people told us is essentially when they pick hardware for their projects, there's a tremendous amount of uh, diversity. Um, obviously, ARM is dominating. When you add up all the ARM you know, parts on this diagram, you've got about 70%. But even in ARM itself, you've got 16-bit, you know, uh, 32-bit, uh, M0, M3, M7 with different profiles and that kind of stuff, and, and it's very varied. And there's a 32% of the rest that's really anything and everything. And 
if you design a solution and your solution is uh, specifically uh, stuck on or, or coupled to an architecture or anything like that, you are at the mercy of your hardware provider, hardware supplier, and this is a major problem that uh, the respondents to our survey identified. So Zephyr is good for that in the sense that it supports multiple architectures out of the box, certainly. And uh, as you will see, we've got additional components that can help, uh, that can help with that uh, at Eclipse. Now, looking at operating systems, um, we were asking in our survey to tell us, OK, which OSs are you using for your IoT embedded projects? OK? And uh, you, you could pick multiple choices. And unfortunately, the question didn't tell us, OK, pick the number one, the number two. It was just check everything that applies. So unfortunately, my data is not that good. But um, uh, FreeRTOS, EmbedOS, RiotOS, Contiki, several operating systems were mentioned more than once. Uh, and you see them on the slide. Uh, but looking at the trends in non-Linux operating system in IoT uh, in our survey, you see a few interesting facts. First, the fact that most established players have seen a decline, okay? And many of them are proprietary in there. And so you see some momentum for open source solutions in the space. And the other is the great decline in no OS or bare metal. And this, for me, is really telling. IoT developers start understanding that you shouldn't write low-level code if you want to deliver something that is quality of our, and on time. Maybe you individually are a genius developer that can do it. Maybe I am. No, I'm not. Maybe you are. But the thing is, the next guy after you, the guy in the next room at the office, is he you know, that top-notch developer that can write low-level code without bugs? Probably not. So to use an operating system is really, really important on a constrained device. And um, I was really happy to see that trend in our survey for sure. And we see that Zephyr is there uh, with 3%, not shrinking, which is considering the overall trend in my graph, an indication that there's momentum there. All right. Now, OK, many, many alternatives for your uh, real-time operating system for a constrained device. How would you would pick one, given the number of stuff that's there? First, there's obviously hardware support. Will it support the CPU, the SOC, the board that you are planning to use? And then there are connectivity and power supply issues. Uh, can, it, can it run well on a battery uh, for 10 years and stuff like that? Obviously, more and more security is important because um, with embedded and constrained devices, it's, it's easy to, to unscrew a sensor or a board from a machine or from the wall or from whatever it is installed and, and run with it. And you don't want that device to be compromised. So you need secure boot, device authentication, all sorts of nifty things there. And that's on the functional side. But on the non-functional side, uh, things to look for are, for example, a lock-in to an upstream distribution or a specific cloud. You don't want to be locked in in anything, I mean, if you are here at a Linux conference. So the same should apply to your constrained devices. Uh, licensing in IP, OK? How is it licensed? Can you do uh, commercial products out of it or not? Um, security updates, CVEs, stuff like that. I mean, only the serious players will be you know, emitting CVEs on their OSs and uh, do a, a strict follow-up on security issues. Safety certification, and obviously, uh, for those that are open source, the number of contributors, not only as a number of individuals that code, but who's behind this? How many organizations are supporting the project? And all of that are very, very important criteria. And obviously, there are quite a few suitable uh, solutions in the market that fulfill those requirements if you are to pick one. But to me, one of the most interesting ones uh, was uh, Zephyr. At the Eclipse Foundation, we don't have an RTOS, so I get to play with whatever I want. And when I tried it, really, Zephyr for me was uh, really a distinctive uh, and interesting uh, OS to work with for a few reasons. First, the fact that it is so modular, so you can tweak it to fit on those very, very small boards with just the minimum amount of functionality that you need. The fact that it supports several uh, trading models, uh, so this makes it more adaptable to um, different use cases. 
uh, a clean driver interface, memory protection, uh, strong support for Bluetooth low energy, which is a lowest common denominator if you're working around constrained devices. Um, and the fact that it's got uh, Bluetooth mesh now uh, is really something. Uh, and a native networking stack because uh, it's a pain to have to deal with those things yourselves. And once again, uh, uh, unless you are a networking genius, you don't want to implement your own little TCP IP stack or anything uh, uh, which is that low level. When we consider uh, Zephyr as an open source project now, I think there are a few things there that are really important and make it interesting as well. Well, first, the, the thing it is open source, uh, but there are two open source projects. What makes it interesting is the fact that its license is permissive, it's Apache, so you can do whatever you want with it, and uh, that it's got vendor neutral governance. And at the Eclipse Foundation, this is literally when you join, you get a few tattoos at uh, hidden places on your body, and uh, the most important one is vendor neutrality. Okay, since I started there, I have to obsess about that. Uh, and uh, well, I'm, you know, the Linux Foundation is certainly another believer in this approach. So. Vendor neutral governance is important because you don't want your RTOS to be something like Golang. Golang is marvelous as a language, it's a technical achievement, okay? And it's got a great community, but this community is stuck proposing to Google improvements and, and modifications to the language, and they, they just have to pray there for Google to accept them or not. Okay, single vendor open source is not the way of doing things. That's why if you pick an OS for your project, you have to pick something that is overseen by some kind of vendor neutral body. Um, Zephyr has also an LTS branch, really, really important if you care about the stability over the long term of your hardware and software combination, especially, well, the talk just before me, they were, they were describing a project uh, with Zephyr on a hearing aid, and they have to certify that with health authorities. So you need your software and hardware combination to be viable for several years, otherwise you are running after bureaucrats, and I, I'm, I'm quite sure that's a pain, right guys? All right. <laughs> And um, another interesting thing about Zephyr is that they are looking to bring, you know, security certification for the code base, which is another, uh, another problem that you don't have to deal with as a developer or as an organization. And, and believe me, um, you don't want to have to deal with that and lawyers and that kind of stuff. Uh, all right. Now, okay, that's the Zephyr part. Uh, I'm here to tell you and you can use Zephyr with Eclipse IoT components. Maybe, okay, let's check. Who was aware that Eclipse was doing stuff in the IoT and embedded space? Oh, a few, okay, but the majority of you didn't. So I'm glad I'm here. So we are doing things there. Um, Eclipse Foundation, uh, I'm quite sure you know the name. Uh, do not confound, please, with just the IDE. We are much more than that. We've got 370 projects now with a bunch of lines of code and everything, uh, doing all of that with about 30 people, uh, most of them in Ottawa, Canada, and we have a team in Europe as well. Um, but in, when you consider our mission and what we've been doing, we have four areas that are really, really strategic to us. Obviously, cloud-native Java is a big thing. We are the new home for Java Enterprise Edition. Whoop, Jakarta EE, that's the new name. Uh, and obviously, uh, IDEs and development tools are very part of our core mission. But IoT and edge computing and automotive are also areas where we have a tremendous level of activity. And um, looking specifically at what we are doing in the IoT space. So that's about 38 projects, 350 plus contributors, 40 member companies. Some of them are uh, big, some of them are small. When you consider the toolkit, I mean, uh, it's got you know, implementations for nearly uh, every protocol you can dream of, really. So MQTT clients and servers, uh, co-op, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not mentioning all of that today. Uh, the, the point is not uh, to be exhaustive here, but just to give you a taste of what we've got in the toolkit. Um, looking at our membership, um, we have lots of organizations, big and small there, and, and that's just the membership, obviously, for IoT. And on the fourth line, you see the Linux Foundation. 
so the Linux and Eclipse Foundations Exchange memberships uh, a few months back, and we are now happy to count the Linux Foundation and specifically the Zephyr project as part as of our IoT family. So because we compete a bit on the edge of things, I would say, it uh, doesn't mean that we can't work together. And in my book, anything that makes open source stronger is a good thing for the industry and for the community. All right. So um, what I will look at now is to give you two specific examples on how you can leverage Zephyr and Eclipse IoT components together to solve specific problems. So for example, you have this marvelous board, you have a bunch of sensors using the I2C uh, protocol, which is a, a serial protocol from the 80s, so you find lots of sensors that will support that, uh, if you are less familiar with that. And uh, let's say you want to write a little app that will read a sensor value. Well, there are two main steps if you write that by hand, which is to send, uh, set up some pin moxes and then interact with the sensor itself. And you see the detailed steps on the slide. Uh, unless you are paid by the number of lines of, of code that you write, this is, well, not necessarily a productive uh, endeavor, right? So we think there's a better way, which is to write five lines of code where essentially you call a constructor for the sensor and call a read function and be done with it. And at Eclipse, this is enabled by two uh, projects that we have that come from Intel, thank you, Intel, uh, that are Eclipse MRA and Eclipse uh, UPM. So in the previous example, MRA handles the pin muxing and memory allocation and the low-level stuff, and UPM is a library that will handle the sensor itself. So you see on the diagram, okay, you have your hardware, you've got physical pins, the kernel of your OS, in this case Zephyr, and then MRA, and on the top of it in user space, UPM. So what are they exactly? So MRA is a kind of uh, standard I.O. interface for IoT hardware. So essentially, it's a kind of hardware abstraction layer that abstracts GPIO, UART, whatever. It's listed on the slide, so I won't uh, name everything there. But most of the devices that are built in on boards or the, the sensors you can find on the market are already um, supported, at least at the protocol level there. And then UPM is a library in user space, as I said, uh, that really provides you uh, a standard uh, sensor and actuator API, so for light, pressure, humidity, temperature, whatever. So whatever the actual type of sensor you have, you write the code you know, once and you run it on multiple platforms, whether it is hardware or software. So both libraries are written in C, C++, and support multiple operating systems. So Zephyr is one of them, but this will run on Linux. And in fact, uh, we have plenty of community members putting that stuff on their edge gateways, for example, because they put sensors on them as well. And uh, the libraries um, support x86, ARM, MIPS, uh, among others, and have bindings for Java, JavaScript, and Python. But obviously, uh, in the case of Zephyr, you will work with that mostly uh, in C. So those are very LT projects that we've got. Uh, the Intel contributed them uh, a few, I think, last year. But they exist since 2014. So they are quite mature with a large community, lots of support, lots of docs. So it's, a, it's really a pleasure to work with those teams. Now let's think about a different problem. If I need to manage those devices, let's say I have a factory with a thousand devices and all of them are fitted with sensors and I want to do predictive maintenance on that and monitor them in real time. Or I have this digital building with thousands of sensors everywhere over multiple floors or maybe a few thousand buses or a few hundred buses or planes or whatever. And once again, there are camera sensors all over the place. So how do I manage that? And there's a standard in the industry that's called the uh, uh, OEMA LWM2M, or, well, lightweight M2M, let's say. Um, and in this case, at uh, the foundation in Eclipse IoT, we've got two distinct implementations of that, one in Java and the other in C. So obviously, in the case of Zephyr, uh, uh, Eclipse Wakama written in C is probably what you want to leverage. It leverages another Eclipse project for DTLS, which is, well, the equivalent in that word for, uh, for uh, TLS, OK? Um, and, and Zephyr has got already uh, features that are built in that will support 
uh, lightweight M2M and DTLS and that kind of stuff. But in this case, uh, especially if you are working with those, those libraries in other environments and Linux uh, environments, you can use the same code you know, across the board, and the same is true for MRAV. Whatever you write uh, elsewhere, we run also on Zephyr, also on those environments. So this could be one of the reasons where you would leverage uh, Eclipse libraries instead of, of the built-in ones, or maybe because of the feature support for a specific thing in newer versions of the standards or stuff like that. And in any case, they are there, and both of them have uh, server-side components as well. So uh, even though uh, you may want to leverage the client part that's already in Zephyr, both Wakama and Leshen enable you to create uh, lightweight M2M servers, and uh, the M2M standard will help you essentially to, to control and monitor devices uh, in a standard way uh, across the industry. Now, if this is not enough, uh, we've got another project that could be of interest for, to you, which is called Eclipse Augbit. And Augbit uh, will use M2M. You see, you see it at the bottom, uh, the bottom right, okay, uh, device management services. But it is a wider scale platform where essentially you want to push software updates to not only constrained devices, but edge nodes as well, uh, across multiple OSs, multiple environments. And this is stuff, I can't name them, but most leading cloud uh, uh, platform as a software providers, okay, think about the, the top two or top three of those are using this without telling you. And on the top of that, this is a core component of the Bosch IoT Suite, a commercial product that it's built uh, on the top of that. So it's got a very, very wide uh, usage in the industry already, and it's a great, great platform built on microservices. You can integrate that with whatever else you want, so it's really uh, a very, very uh, good platform to work with. All right. Now, if we take a step back and think about IoT and embedded uh, development, there are many, many, many functional concerns. Some of them are about the constraint device itself. Some of them is about the edge and the gateways or whatever. And obviously, some of them are about the cloud. So when you consider overall what we have at the Eclipse Foundation, well, we've got uh, tools and solutions for most of those concerns. And for those uh, that we don't have, like the RTOS or OS for the constraint device, we are more than happy to work with the Linux Foundation on rising uh, uh, awareness of Zephyr because we think it's a great platform to work with. And uh, I'm still a coder, although uh, I don't code as much as I want because I travel all the time, I speak all the time instead. But let's say that uh, if I were to start my own little business tomorrow, uh, Zephyr would be probably my, uh, my tool of choice uh, for the operating system. So, uh, plenty of stuff, uh, very high level. My apologies for that. So next year, I will certainly uh, propose a few more detailed sessions about how it is to code with all of that. But given this is my first year here, uh, I thought giving you uh, a first taste and introduction to it would be better. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Eclipse IoT components, uh, we've got our website, iot.eclipse.org slash projects. But this is just, for the time being, a very dry list of projects. So if you need any assistance, please reach out to me. Okay, we can sit together and figure out what's the best fit for your specific project, specific product that you are working on. Uh, please try our technology. All of our stuff is open source and uh, permissively licensed. Okay, so you can do whatever you want with it, and we are just here to help. We've got a newsletter, an official uh, Twitter account for that, and we've got our own little conference, so if you happen to like Germany uh, and be around uh, there in October, then uh, EclipseCon has a full IoT track where you will learn more about several of the stuff uh, you know, that I discussed today, and much more, obviously, because we have uh, interesting things brewing, especially around uh, edge computing. So we are uh, on the brim of announcing our um, edge computing working group. We'll have also something called the spark plug specification working group, which is essentially a standard on the top of the MQTT protocol in order to make devices that implement it interoperable. Because, um, well, if you ever worked with MQTT as a protocol, it's a bit like uh, working with uh, Java messaging or uh, WebSphere MQ or whatever. 
You know, it works well at, at the transport level, but I mean, it doesn't specify anything about the payload. And the payload is key to make devices interoperate together. So we are working on solving that problem with uh, members of our community. And obviously looking forward to uh, hear from you and, and get you involved because that's the thing. This call of action is not just to consume the stuff. This call of action uh, to action is really to uh, involve yourselves and contribute to the projects because while well, essentially open source, you won't reap the full benefits until you contribute. And the reason for that is simple. When you have a critical bug on a Friday at 10.20 p.m. and you need somebody to support you, I guarantee you, even if you have a SLA with a commercial vendor, they will not help you out in a meaningful way. They will have some kind of intern or whatever that will handle the ticket, you know, and that's it. So when you are a member of an open source community, what happens is that you know the guys who wrote the code because you're part of them. So if you have a critical issue, they will come to your help because you're part of one big family. So that's our approach to things. So I'm looking forward to see contributions for you all, uh, from you all at some point. Um, and that's it for now. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. And uh, I think we've got enough time for at least a few questions if I didn't scare you. So thank you.